Biblical scripture often speaks of hell as a place where the disobedient and wicked are cast and are doomed forever. It is typically associated with a suffering in the burning of flames of a hot environment with the companionship of Satan and his angels. But considering that people in hell are already dead and cannot physically die again and are no longer confined to a fragile mortal body, how can they be vulnerable to the fires and heat that we have come to know on earth? So what is hell really like? To begin with, the description given for the environment of hell must be allegorical, as are other biblical descriptions that are provided in the scriptures, particularly by John in the book of Revelation. An understanding of our premortal life helps to define some of what we can anticipate for our continued life hereafter, one way or another. After reading many accounts of people from all walks of life and religious background who claim to have a near-death experience, I find it fascinating that many of those accounts speak of their renewed friendships with people they had never met or known on earth. While our memory of premortal life is temporarily veiled from us, we will have a renewed remembrance of that world when we leave mortality. We will have a full recollection of our acceptance and faith in Jesus Christ and the spiritual goals and expectations that we had placed on ourselves for our life on earth. We will either be pleased, content, or be haunted with unrepented regrets of serious consequence by the decisions we made in mortality. If we have serious regrets, it is possible no one will need to send us to hell. We would probably prefer to banish ourselves on our own accord. Behold, I say unto you, that ye would be more miserable to dwell with a holy and just God, under a consciousness of your filthiness before him, than ye would to dwell with the damned souls in hell. One of the best explanations I have ever read about those with sorrows hereafter is found in the ninth chapter of 2 Nephi of the Book of Mormon, as it allegorically describes the torment of regret as being similar to a lake of fire and brimstone. And assuredly, as the Lord liveth, for the Lord God hath spoken it, and it is his eternal word, which cannot pass away, that they who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still. Wherefore, they who are filthy are the devil and his angels, and they shall go away into everlasting fire prepared for them. And their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever, and has no end. Perhaps surprising to many, since the fire of Hades is more emotional than physical, hell apparently does not have a hot atmosphere at all, but rather quite cold. Being devoid of the light of Christ, hell in outer darkness would be an environment where the warmth from the love of God does not exist, and the cold-hearted shall dwell. I'm convinced that I encountered the presence of an evil spirit once in my life during my college years in St. Louis. When the 1980 summer semester ended, I decided to take my family back to Pennsylvania and visit relatives for the summer as we had often done. My wife, Candy, said she would ask our neighbors across the street if they would check in on our home from time to time while we were gone. They were a very fine family of a classmate that I had befriended. About three or four weeks later, we returned home. When I opened the door, I took two steps in and stopped immediately. I felt a very cold feeling, and this was a hot summer afternoon in August. It was not the type of cold where you could see your breath, but a cold feeling that penetrates deep inside of you that is very tangible. It was very real, and I had never experienced a cold sensation like that before. Candy was behind me and asked what was wrong. She and I both recalled me saying, I feel like someone has gone through our house with a fine-tooth comb. The feeling in the house was very odd and strange to me, but within an hour after everyone had settled in, the house returned to feeling like our home again. We had returned home from extended trips many times before, but nothing like this had ever occurred nor felt this way. I was puzzled as to why I had such a feeling. After all, the family across the street that Candy had arranged to oversee the house 
consisted of our church members who seemed to have a good spirit about them. Later that day, after talking to Candy about the incident, she informed me that she didn't ask the neighbors across the street, but instead had given our house key to a recluse person who lived in the largest three-story townhouse in the complex down the street. The only thing Candy knew about this person was that she had seemed nice to our children. Several months later, with winter approaching, Candy went to the upstairs closet to retrieve a handmade quilt she had stored in the bottom of a box of blankets. It was missing. She also started noticing other items that were missing, items that were heirloom in value. Candy was concerned and decided to pray about the matter. She said before her prayer was ended, she knew that the person down the street who tended the house had taken the items. Several months passed. I finished school and had traveled out of state to arrange for housing and the startup of a business. Anticipating our move to a new home in the near future, Candy told me she had prayed that somehow she would get the quilt back. While I was gone, a neighbor visited Candy and informed her that he and other neighbors had been missing items from their homes as well. Candy told him about our experience and he suggested they go into the woman's house and look for stolen goods. Candy initially refused the offer, but after some persistent persuasion, she agreed. So one afternoon when the woman had gone away, Candy and our neighbor went in through the unlocked back door of her house. While in the house, they found what they described as a warehouse full of goods, rooms filled with items with doors tied together with rope. After looking for a while, they couldn't find any of Candy's items, and she wanted to leave. But the neighbor was confident they would find them. Finally, they found one item after another. As it turned out, the only items they were able to identify were the ones belonging to Candy. She was the only person in the neighborhood who had retrieved any stolen possessions. Biblical history tells us about evil spirits that often possess people in that day. And I've often asked myself, why not in today's world? I've considered the possibility that an evil spirit had become very comfortable associating with a recluse woman who occupied our house while we were in Pennsylvania. That evil spirit had lingered in our home and became uncomfortable with our being there and soon departed after our arrival. For certain, and for some strange reason, I physically perceived an unusual cold presence inside of a very hot and humid house immediately when walking in the doorway and knew that someone had carefully inventoried all of our possessions. If you want to know what hell is really like, it is the continual fire of regret for the realization of what we have lost that will blaze within our memory after death. Hell is also an environment of intense depression that is shared among those of the same circumstance. It is a burning that is within. Fortunately, hell is a temporary abode until the final judgment when death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to the works. The occupants of hell can still repent by suffering, as Jesus did for their own sins, to obtain the least glory in the resurrection. Those who refuse or cannot repent will likely join Satan and his castaway angels into outer darkness, where the light of Christ will never shine.